Hello, greetings. Hello, everyone. I'm Jamal Sowell. I serve as the Commerce Secretary for the state of Florida. And I want to thank you for joining today's Haitian American Business Leaders Summit. I want to first thank um, my team and Veronica Valdez for organizing this opportunity and, our, and also our amazing moderator who will be speaking very soon, Murdoche La France. She's very exciting, very charismatic. So I know she will um, really um, say a lot of great things about what we're doing in the state, but also how we can empower businesses. In my role, I want you to know that we are meeting the challenges that have come forth in 2020 head on through cohesive approaches that emphasize coordinated workforce training strategies, strategic partnerships at both the state and local level and export markets for Florida made goods. One of the first goals I outlined for Enterprise Florida when I began in 2019 was a deeper engagement with our small and minority businesses around the state. Our governor, Ron DeSantis, has a passion for that. So it's exciting as we get to engage with communities in every part of Florida. I hope we'll, this will be the first of many favorable interactions you have with Enterprise Florida and our partners. Florida's business community is diverse in its industries, culture, and consumer base. The Haitian American community in Florida is a special part of that diversity. The heritage and engagement of Haitian American Floridians is widely admired and critical to our overall economic well being. For me, I was born and raised in Orlando, a part called Pine Hills that was heavily Haitian American. And all the time, people would ask me if I was Haitian because I spoke a little Creole, even though it wasn't that good. But that was because I was taught by my friends. So they would ask me uh, when I would go places, was I Haitian or Jamaican or Trini? I said, no, I was just born, I was born in Orlando. They said, well, are you, are you sure? Because you speak some, some, a little bit of Creole words. Are you just black? And then I would tell them about my friends and who are actually on this uh, webinar now, uh, Friendy Clairvaux and Marcus Pierre. And they taught me about the three L's, uh, l'église, l'école, la caille, which is school, uh, church, school, home. And because of that, I would go to church services with them around the state, whether it was Orlando at Ebenezer, Haitian Baptist Church with Pastor Mashad, or Mount Olive Church of God, the New Jerusalem in Miami with Pastor Lawar. And learning about the culture, um, made so many good friends over the years. And whether it was learning about Zezi Vivon or Bon Dieu Bon or different words, it really allowed me to see the entrepreneurial drive, education drive, and also the faith um, uh, foundation of those who are Haitian American here in Florida. So over the past year, we experienced unprecedented disruption to our economy because of COVID-19, but Florida is as resilient as it is diverse. We are bouncing back and will work to reach marks even higher than those we were reaching um, a year ago. This state is pro-business. We tax no more than is needed and regulate no more than is necessary. In Florida, we have opted to get people back to work we know that every job is essential when it's yours. I will continue to work with the business community to get our state moving again. And forums like this are, are ways that we are doing that. I invite you to engage with Enterprise Florida as well as our partners at CareerSource and the Florida State Minority Supplier Development Council as you pursue your own business goals. We look forward to being strong partners for the Haitian American business community in our diverse state. Thank you for joining today's summit and may God bless our work together and Beniswa Le Tenel. Thank you, Secretary Sal, for the opportunity to be a part of such an amazing opportunity to celebrate the Haitian American business community, as well as to share some resources that we believe might be beneficial to all of us. The reason we are here, as we all know, not just in my life, but in the lives of many entrepreneurs, there are challenges that small business owners face. Starting a business, maintaining a business, and then growing that business. Addressing these challenges is a large part of what Enterprise Florida is all about. Like many of you, I have over 25 years of experience as a minority small business owner. I understand the needs and challenges that come with it. Most specifically, being born and raised in Miami, Florida, I remember during my time when some of the first Haitians came over to South Florida. Building up 
I remember them building up little Haiti. And most importantly, I remember the struggles that many of them had. Information, not available. Resources, not available. Access, not available. While we have come a long way, believe it or not, many of these challenges still exist. This is why Enterprise Florida is so important. And this is why I became a part of Enterprise Florida. Not only do I believe in the entrepreneurial spirit that's needed to build up each of our communities in the state of Florida, I also believe in Enterprise Florida's responsibility to embrace and to provide the resources needed to match that entrepreneurial spirit. As the official economic development organization of the state of Florida, the MassBank division is the specific division which is designed to help minority and small businesses help them grow. How many of us are minority small business owners who have a thriving business? We've tapped into our target market and we're looking to expand by offering perhaps a new product. What do we need? I'm glad you asked. The number one answer is capital. What about small business owners, minority business owners that are looking to expand into a new geographical market? What do we need? The number one answer is capital. And many would also say that the number one answer is access. These are the very needs that MassBAC addresses every day. As I mentioned before, the Minority and Small Business Capital Program is designed to help small and minority businesses with training options, development options, and also access to capital. We accomplish this in two ways, through one-on-one -on -one consultations designed to educate minority and small business owners regarding the opportunities provided to them around the state. We also provide webinars, seminars, and boot camps that are hosted by Enterprise Florida and our many strategic partners like this event tonight. Not only do we assist through consultations and trainings, but we also assist through our capital programs. The loan participation program is one where EFI many times backs loans and buys back up to 50% of the loan. In other words, lending institutions are given the incentive to loan to minority and small businesses when otherwise they may not be inclined to do so. The second capital program is the microfinance guarantee. That is where EFI will guarantee up to 50% of the loan. In other words, lenders are given the additional security that they need to feel more comfortable loaning to minority and small businesses. The third way that MASBAC assists is through minority and small business development efforts. We will continue throughout the year to support existing organizations and all minority um, development entities to make sure that every small and minority business, and of course that includes within the Haitian American community, has the opportunity to grow. Now with no further ado, I will introduce the moderator of this great event. Um, she is Murdoshi Taylor LaFrance. She is the state and local government lobbyist for Verizon. Uh, the principal consultant of iTaylor Solutions, LLC. And most importantly, she is a 16-year member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Murdoshi. Thank you so much, Veronica and Secretary Sowell, for that incredible introduction. I want to welcome everyone who is tuning in. Um, if you all can do us a favor, there are some folks who have started this in the chat already, but if you can go ahead and drop your location, where are you joining us from? We want to know. Because as Jamal said, excuse me, Secretary Sal said, you know, this is EFI's uh, mission is really to, to advance the cause of everyone across the state. And of course, Haitians have a role to play, right? That's exactly why we're here tonight. So I encourage you all to get in the chat. Let us know where you're, where you're from. Maybe you're in Florida. Maybe you're not in Florida. Maybe, you know, you're tuning in from one of the, the islands in the Caribbean or from some incredible remote location. We really want to know where you're from. I want to go ahead and again, thank them and level set what this conversation is going to be like tonight, what this summit is going to be. So I'm going to go ahead and have an incredible fireside chat with a co-managing shareholder 
for one of the largest law firms in the country, probably internationally. And then we're gonna go ahead and tell you about some incredible resources for small businesses. And then after we're done, we're gonna go ahead and have an engaging and interactive panel discussions with some rock stars from around the state of Florida. Listen, we know that there are more than the five uh, rock stars that I'm gonna talk to. And so as I'm talking to either attorney Jean Wilson, who I'll have the fireside chat with, or I'm speaking to the panel, let us know what your questions are. There is a Q&A box. So if you have a question, go ahead and drop it in there based on what the speakers are saying. Or if you just wanna you know, affirm what the speakers are saying, go ahead and use the chat function. I wanna go ahead and uh, encourage everyone to really remain engaged. I think, you know, Veronica and Secretary Sal will mention this. This is not intended to be a, you know, first shot or, you know, one shot, one kill event. This is really about sustained engagement with the Haitian community. We play such an incredible role in this state as does a lot of different other groups from the Caribbean. And so we really, really wanna encourage you to remain engaged. Um, remain engaged by contacting Veronica Valdez. You know, she's been an incredible partner uh, for this event. Email her. I'm going, I'm, you know, Veronica can kill me later, but you all can go ahead and email Veronica. She is such an incredible resource for, for Enterprise Florida and anything that you want or desire for your small business, even if she doesn't have the answer, I'm pretty sure she'll be able to guide you to the resource that you need. Um, again, I want to encourage everyone to get involved. If you have a question, use the Q&A. If you have, you know, something that you want to say, use the chat function, because believe it or not, we're actually going to be paying attention to it. Now, let's go ahead and get started. As I mentioned, you know, we're going to kick off this event with an incredible fireside chat. Um, I'm going to have a really, I would say, honest and authentic discussion with attorney Jean Wilson, who's a co-managing shareholder, excuse me, of Greenberg Traurig, which is a law firm, and I'm pretty sure everyone knows about it. I am not going to bore you all with reading his bio because I want him to authentically tell you about his upbringing. I want him to tell you about his journey to where he is now, which is all really going to, in, I think, you know, enrich the lives of everyone that's watching. And so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and ask attorney Jean Wilson, so instead of reading your bio, attorney, who is Jean E. Wilson, the co-managing shareholder at Greenberg Traurig? Well, uh, first and foremost, um, I am uh, the son of two proud Haitians. Um, I was uh, born in uh, Port-au-Prince, Haiti, um, uh, next to the youngest of nine children. And um, we... Um, we came from Haiti in spurts. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, there, there, there was uh, not a whole lot of uh, uh, opportunity to pack nine kids up at the same time. So uh, uh, we came in groups of four. And I was in the second group of four that came to the States in 1968. Um, traveled to uh, uh, Chicago, Illinois, where uh, I uh, was introduced to uh, uh, below zero weather and uh, 26 inches of snow. Um, so, um, but we, we um, uh, lived in a uh, three bedroom apartment, of 12 people. And you can imagine how uh, cozy that was. We had uh, grandmothers and cousins and everything else on top of the uh, eight children. And um, I, I watched um, my, uh, my father uh, and, and, and my mother hustle to uh, get us out of that three bedroom apartment to uh, ultimately buy a two flat, uh, which my father quickly figured out that if he uh, rented the uh, first floor, I'm sorry, the second floor, and we lived on the first floor and we built out the basement to accommodate the 15 or so people that uh, were in the family that uh, he could pay that his mortgage. And uh, that was the beginning of uh, the uh, lessons that I learned about what it takes to, to hustle and survive. Um, and, uh, um, you know, that was kind of uh, uh, the uh, foundation for who I am and what drives me and, uh, and, and who I am today. Thank you for that. I think one of the things that I think everyone will probably identify with uh, that's tuning in is 
the fact that, you know, when our parents came over here, you know, we, we turned single family homes, <laughs> multifamily homes, right? So whether it was like six or seven or eight or 10 or 12 or 15, you name it. Um, we, we tried to, to really embrace that, that notion of community, right? Um, you know, for everyone to live together and to be together because that's, that's what our parents knew, right? And so as you think about, you know, your upbringing and, and that flat that your, 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 you know, your dad purchased and, you know, being in close quarters with your family, you know, what are some of the biggest challenges that you faced being reared in a, in a Haitian household? And I know there, there might be many, <laughs> sure, whatever you share with us, we'll probably we'll definitely be able to identify with. <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll tell you, um, I was having this conversation with uh, my youngest brother, my, my youngest brother's nine years uh, younger than me. Um, and, um, he, uh, constantly complains about being the youngest. And, uh, I complain about the fact that he took my spot as the youngest, uh, <laughs> but, um, but realistically, the biggest problem that I, I had was the fact that because my father always worked two jobs and, and had a side hustle, he was, he didn't have a lot of time for disciplining. So his rule was the oldest always gets to tell the youngest what to do. And if you don't like it, you wait till he gets home and then he'll kind of uh, take care of things. And unfortunately for me, I, I didn't like that too much. So uh, I would try to take matters into my own hands. And inevitably, even if I was right, because I, did, I didn't follow instructions, I get punished. And so I, I grew up really resenting that and resenting being so low on the totem pole. Mm -hmm. But actually, as I was reminding my, my brother, it, uh, as I grew up, I realized that was probably the best thing that could have ever, ever happened to me. Um, I reminded him that uh, my first three vehicles were gifted to me by my siblings. And wow. uh, I, I have four sisters who are four mothers to me today, even at 61, I, they still get to tell me what to do. Um, and so those are the things that I didn't appreciate as a, as a young person coming up that when I was in law school, uh, I was in law school at University of Florida in Gainesville. One of my sisters, if a mom couldn't come down every two weeks, would come down and fill up my refrigerator. And those are the kinds of things to me that um, uh, were frustrating <laughs> originally, but as I grew up, I learned to appreciate. That's amazing. I, you know, again, all of us, I'm sure can identify with what you just said. You know, the lessons are, are really hard, right? But you get older. And I think, you know, there, you know, we, we say here, you know, hindsight is 2020. And so I'm pretty sure all of us have those moments where we think, you know what, maybe I didn't enjoy the discipline, maybe I didn't enjoy that, but right now it's really serving me well. Absolutely. Um, so as you so you just talked about a challenge. What are some of the most memorable lessons of your adolescence? And I feel like what you just talked about is a, is definitely a lesson, but what are some others that you can share with our audience? Well, uh, one of the, the, the key pieces that um, I recall, and that still drives how we do what we do today in our family, um, as you said, we, we were always together. My, my family uh, moved to Chicago. Then uh, uh, in 1976, um, they left Chicago and moved to Jacksonville. Within two and a half years uh, after my parents moved to Jacksonville, uh, seven of the nine of us moved within a mile or so radius of them. We left Chicago and came down. I left Chicago and came to law school in Florida and stayed. Um, and one of the things that I think continued uh, the big lessons that, uh, that uh, my father and, and, and mother put in place was every time one of us got a job, he always required us to, to give an allowance to the folks who weren't working. So part of everybody's salary went to, you know, to, to take care of you know, the others who weren't working. And, and as I told you, I, the first three vehicles I had were gifted to me by my, my uh, brothers and sisters. Obviously they weren't new vehicles and the reason that three of them, they kept breaking down and I, another one to give me another one. And, um, and so today, the lesson that I try to teach uh, my kids and, and the second generation who didn't have the benefit of that wisdom 
is that it's all about sharing. We, we really do have to take care of one another and Indeed. it starts with the family. Indeed. And so while that dollar out of their paycheck uh, may not seem like much, but that helped, helped me. And now with the uh, blessings that I have had, I get to take care of my siblings who took such good care of me. And that opportunity to pay it forward is what I think hopefully within the Haitian community and in the larger minority community carries forward. And that was a lesson that I didn't get at the time. Certainly yeah. when I had to plop down those dollar bills, um, <laughs> I put a good job making a dollar 60 an hour. Uh, that was a tough pill to swallow back then, but the investment that was in everybody coming together still rings true today. Oh, that's amazing. I, you know, pay it forward is such a powerful concept. And I think although, you know, our parents don't necessarily call it that, um, I think it's a powerful concept because you just never know where you'll end up in life. And so being able to take care of those closest to you, you know, as a, as a man of faith, I'm sure, you know, in the back of your mind, you knew when your parents reinforced for you that, you know, somehow, some way God was going to take care of you. Um, that was really good. That was really good. Um, well, uh, I will tell you, it was enforced in other harsh ways as well. So uh, well, that, uh, that, that, that's a good point. That's a good, <laughs> point. <laughs> that's a good point. That's a really good point. Um, let's pivot a little bit. Um, I would say, actually, no, let's stay where we are. Let's talk about your rearing and, and maybe we'll pivot to career in a moment. But, you know, all of us as Haitian professionals, you know, we're all too familiar with our parents' very overprotective nature and their desire to steer our personal and professional lives. You know, I think you said it earlier, it doesn't matter how old you are. You're, you know, if, if you have an older sibling or your parents, you can be six and you can be 66. They're gonna try to, you know, kind of steer your life. Um, what helped inform your decision to pursue law? So as you think about, you know, why you went to law school, you know, why you're, you're a Gator, was it your parents sort of, you know, molding? Did they sort of steer you? <laughs> no, doctor, lawyer, nurse. Well, it's a very, it's a very short story. Um, as you can imagine, coming from Haiti and being as poor as we're, uh, my, my parents un always understood about, you know, uh, what a doctor and a lawyer does, and that's the top of the heap. And they figured with nine kids, at least one of them should be a doctor, at least one of them should be a lawyer. This is the other thing connecting back to your earlier question about the, the vagaries of being so low on the totem pole. As it, when it was my time to go to school, uh, my parents realized they were running out of options. Mm -hmm. They only had two left. And so uh, it was ordained that uh, mm -hmm. I would be the lawyer. Uh, I don't know how uh, he chose lawyer versus doctor. I'm so glad he chose lawyer because I don't think I would have made it to medical school. Uh, but, uh, so, so there wasn't a choice involved. And uh, for most of my life, I, I didn't, I'd never met a lawyer. In fact, I never met a lawyer until I went to law school. Wow. That, that there was no exposure there. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was that, uh, uh, that di direction that uh, my father gave me and it wasn't for a discussion. Um, so we got busy about it. I was heading to be a business major um, and uh, had signed up to go to a program to help minorities get into business. And um, so I had to uh, redirect and, but it's still, uh, the only concession my father made is that even though most law students get to be go, uh, a political science major to get to law school, he allowed me to stay in this program only because I got a, a summer job out of it. So mm. to, get, to keep that summer job, I had to stay as a business major and then and not a political science major. So oh. that's how uh, that decision came about. Uh, and that's why I'm here today as a lawyer. Well, we, we appreciate it. I, again, I don't, I don't think you know, our audience can quite understand how just incredible of a professional you really have been, your tenure in law and in the legal profession the fact that you've been able to conquer not just Florida, but, you know, Georgia as well. Because, um, you know, again, we, we didn't read your bio, but for those of you who are with us, you know, I encourage you to, you know, do a little bit of research on attorney Jean Wilson. He's absolutely amazing. So let's go ahead and pivot a little bit. So we, we talked about your rearing. 
And I want to I want to shift the conversation to career. So, you know, you talked about sort of, you know, how it was that you came to law. Um, but I think what's even more important is your track record and tenure at Greenberg Traurig. So my question is, you know, what is Greenberg Traurig's it factor and how important is a work environment to our personal and professional success? That's a great question. Um, uh, I started, uh, this is unfortunate, uh, unfortunately, year 38 uh, in practicing <laughs> law. Um, as I as I, I started out as a real estate lawyer mm. and uh, back in the early 80s in Miami uh, with a, a big law firm by the name of Holland and Knight and uh, quickly realized that um, um, I was not going to make it uh, sitting at a you know 15th chair uh, working for uh, lawyers that didn't care if I came or, go, came or went. I didn't have a godfather. And, um, and as, as someone, uh, I think Veronica mentioned back in the early eighties, uh, I was being, I, I was being asked to do a lot of the, uh, community efforts, uh, within the Haitian community. We, were, yeah. we, we had all of the, uh, uh, issues with Crone and the Haitian migration in. And so I was being pigeonholed to do what a Haitian lawyer would do or a black lawyer would do. So I moved from that to come to Orlando, uh, but I decided it was still a challenge in terms of uh, trying to find real estate work that real estate clients that would come to me because mm -hmm. there were no black developers, there were no real black players in the real estate market. So I was always working for someone else. So I pivoted away from that and got into the public finance uh, uh, side of the practice because I realized there were at least some black elected officials that I could get to uh, give me an opportunity and, uh, and, and thankfully gain some success in that area. So when Greenberg Traurig came along, it was the opportunity to take that platform, that, that national platform, because I the firm that I was with at the time was a statewide firm. And we had some you know, relatively decent success. And I realized I had something there, I had a brand because there were so few blacks doing what I did. And so if I could take that nationally, then we could leverage that significantly. So in 1993, uh, I took a group of six lawyers uh, uh, that were working with me and moved to Greenberg Traurig to take advantage of that national platform. But one of the key pieces coming back to your question is that I negotiated a scenario where they would let me run my practice and those six floors in the way that I had envisioned and in the way that I was doing at a much smaller firm. So I got the best of both worlds in that I gained a national and international platform, but I controlled my own destiny and I controlled my people. And to this day, when I, I, I moved and started the practice in Atlanta, those are still the people that are in my group. I have a couple of lawyers in um, New York that are part of my practice. And so I still get to do what I do in the way I do it inside of a behemoth law firm. Yeah, that's that's amazing. That's incredible. I think, you know, again, you having so many people report to you and being able to do things your way is just really important. And I think, you know, there's nothing like that, being able to be a professional to do things your way and to still succeed in the way that you have. And just as you said, you know, having 38 years of practicing law, that's absolutely incredible. Um, as we think about that, you know, a lot of times, you know, some of us will do TED Talks and, you know, whether it's on YouTube or what have you, or we're, you know, we're chasing after leadership conferences. And a lot of times we're fed some of the success stories, but no one really talks about what, what happens in the background, right? So um, my question is, what, leadership lessons or a leadership lesson that no one ever talks about? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one, but I'll tell you from my perspective. Um, in fact, when I, in uh, 2004, when Greenberg approached me, the firm was being run by a gentleman uh, by the name of Cesar Alvarez. And um, one of the things I said to him is I, I was at a small firm where I made all the decisions I was the managing partner of the firm. And now uh, he was trying to invite me to come into Greenberg Traurig where 
Now, he was the guy that made all the decisions. And so I was going to have to release all of the controls over to one man. And, and, and you know, being from Haiti and remembering what dictatorship is like, I wasn't, I wasn't cool with that. And uh, so what he explained to me is this concept of servant leadership. Yes. And uh, what he said is, you know, his view of the world is, yes, he has all the power, but what he tries to do is rule by consensus. And if he ever has to rule by, by the power of his office, then he's doing something wrong. Wow. And though that was more talk <laughs> than, than reality, that impacted me a lot. And I, I, I looked up servant leadership and, and, and really studied that and made that part of who I am. And the reason that I've been able to, most of the people that have been with me uh, have been with me for at least 20 years. Uh, wow. Most of my lawyers and my staff don't leave because they feel like they own a piece of the rock. And wow. part of what uh, I try to do is get people to buy in on the, 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 sto the storyline, the vision that I have, because coming from the background that I have, I started with nothing. And I keep telling people, I'm, I'm never afraid of going back to being poor because mm. I've been there. <laughs> and, and so I, I, don't, I don't get nervous in the service. And I think every one of my people will, will be able to tell you that they hear that a lot. I don't get nervous in the service. And this is part about why I have a vision and they bought into my vision so that I could come into their shop. And till today when we're doing all the social justice stuff, that's mm -hmm. what really is now one of my main uh, drivers now is to really get the firm to understand that we now need to take our game to the next level in terms of helping minorities and particularly black folk do well within the firm. So that leadership piece, being able to understand that even if you have power, that power is only as good as the people you use it against, because if mm -hmm. those folks feel like they're being put upon, they'll revolt. Right. And so part of what I've tried to do is get folks to understand that we win if we all win. Yes. And that's, that's why folks have still been around for 20, you know, I've got one partner that's been with me now for 30 years. Wow, that's incredible. I mean, you, there, there was just so much in there, such richness, servant leadership, um, and the emphasis on making sure that your people are with you. That's really important. And having people stay around, you know, stay with you, not having that high turnover because they not only want to work, but they believe in your vision and what you're able to accomplish at, at your firm. Um, let's see, I think we're probably coming up on some time, but, but this is, I guess, more germane to today's time. And I think everyone will appreciate this question. Um, so, you know, we talked about challenges and, and things that you've endured in your career. You know, 26 days ago, we ran it, rang in the new year, right? Like our, our homes, unfortunately, became our new offices. Um, mute became the new shh. <laughs> and, uh, you know, masks sort of became, you know, necessary accessory. Our normalcy was really upended by this thing called COVID-19. Um, you know, our, our personal vulnerabilities were and very much still are in full view, you know, whether you're a working mom that has to balance, you know, her children and being on Zoom or name your streaming platform or what have you. Um, and faith really has become an anchor for so many of us. So as an attorney, as a business and community leader, as a father, you know, as a mentor, um, how important is it for us to extend grace not only to those around us, but to ourselves at this particular time? That, that is such a powerful question. Um, and, and it's something that um, I've been dealing with uh, both on the personal and professional side. Um, uh, during the last uh, 15 months, um, I've lost five family members. Wow. And um, one due to COVID. Um, and we in our office have had at least uh, seven instances of lawyers or staff um, dealing with COVID. So as a manager, I had to deal with it. Um, and uh, as uh, a father and a, and a husband, we've had to uh, face these issues. And one of the things that um, 
I have uh, come to, and, and I said this uh, to my uh, uh, office uh, uh, as soon as we started dealing with moving our, our, our staff to a virtual world, that the, the mental strain of this pandemic is gonna be as costly as the physical strain. And so what, so grace is really important in that regard. And as you said, it's not only grace for others who are dealing with stuff, because no matter how bad my situation is, there's somebody who's got it worse. Yeah. But grace to yourself and understand that every day you're gonna face another challenge and allowing yourself to renew and recharge. Um, one of the things that I uh, have tried to, and my wife doesn't even like to hear it anymore, but I talked to her about, and I talked to my team about controlling the controllables. Yes. Understanding the things that are within your control and mm -hmm. the things that are not. Right. The man upstairs has a plan and he's gonna do his part. Right. You gotta get to doing your part. And that's what's right in front of you. Control that piece and most of the other pieces will fall together. No matter how desperate the situation is, no matter how painful it is, there are certain things you can do to make it better, but it's certainly not gonna get better if you don't do those things. You, you can be prayed up all you want, but you gotta do those things right in front of you to impact your situation. But give yourself the grace to understand you can't change everything. You can't right. change other people. That's so right. that, that's that's probably the main thing that I've I've come to uh, to to appreciate. And then on the on the on the um, professional side, I in addition to that, I keep reminding people, and this is something that another one of my uh, uh, sayings that they'll uh, get tired of of, of of repeating. But trust your talent trust your process because we all been gifted with some phenomenal talent. Right. And so in addition to staying prayed up, <laughs> you got to stay confident in you and the God given right. talent that you have. And if you have a good process, 90% of the time you get a good result. That's right. If you have a bad process, maybe 10% of the time you might happen to get a good result. But if you do go through a good process and trust your talent, 90% of the time, you'll come out pretty well. That's amazing. Um, if you all in the chat can go ahead and I don't know if you can do clapping emojis or you know talk about some of the affirmations that attorney Jean Wilson just talked about. Attorney, our time is up, but I wish we could absolutely continue this conversation. But thank you so much for being with us this evening. Um, everyone, again, Attorney Jean Wilson, co-managing shareholder at Greenberg Traurig, mentor, attorney, husband, father, consummate Haitian professional. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, Adoshi. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you so much. All right. Um, again, I want to emphasize for those of you who are on, go ahead and, you know, clap, uh, drop in an emoji, uh, talk, talk to us about what your takeaways were from that incredible fireside chat with attorney Jean Wilson. It was absolutely amazing. I have so many other questions for him that I'll probably ask him offline, but please, please, please just let him know how impactful that fireside co uh, conversation was. Um, I did have some Q&A. We do see them, but we're going to try to keep um, ourselves on time. So to the extent that we can get to the Q&A questions, we'll get to them. I promise everyone that. Um, we're going to go ahead and pivot um, you know, you just heard from an incredible business leader and attorney. Now we're going to share with you before um, we get to our incredible panel, we're going to share some resources with you. The first person that I want to call up is Mr. Darby Israel. He is a business analyst with Career Source Central Florida. And for those of you on here, career, there are Career Source offices throughout our entire state. So Darby's going to talk to you about some general resources that you can take advantage of. Darby, take it away. All right, thank you, Marche. Um, bonsoir tout le monde, comment nous y est? Vraiment content de partager ressources, uh, Career Source Central Florida avec nous pour um, 
Donc, tout le monde là qui est entrepreneur ou qui a un business, um, Career Source Central Florida, nous offre un pile, un pile de ressources um, pour nous. Uh, specifically, just a little bit about, about myself, I work um, in the Business Intelligence Department at Career Source Central Florida. Uh, my team supports our service delivery team, as well as our business functions with uh, reporting, data analytics, um, process documentation and process improvement. Uh, something very special about Career Source Central Florida is that in 2016, we began, we began a journey um, of organizational excellence by adopting the Florida Sterling Framework for Performance Excellence. And so we've been able to improve our processes and the value that we provide to our customers. Um, next slide. So a little bit about Career Source Central Florida. Um, we serve five counties, but um, the other 24 workforce boards serve everyone throughout the state. And so if you're not in Central Florida, there's a Career Source office um, near you. And you can just log on to the website or Google them and you'll be able to find the one that's nearest to you. Specifically for Central Florida, we have five centers, one in Lake, Orange, Osceola, Seminole, and Sumter. Uh, we operate over, uh, we operate with a, a $30.5 million budget given, give or take a million or two based on the unemployment rate. Next slide. Right. Who do we serve? Um, primarily, we serve career seekers and businesses in our region. And that same holds true for other career source offices in their regions. Um, in terms of priority, veterans do receive priority of service and priority of service in terms of employment opportunities, training, placement services, and placements. Next slide. Who else do we serve? We serve organizations, employers in the five high growth industries. That's healthcare, construction utilities, information technology, trade and transportation, and advanced manufacturing. These industries have been identified um, as high growth and a priority for our region. Next slide. This graph here is a quick service model of how that service is delivered, right? On the two accesses, you see businesses and career seekers. For the businesses, we analyze the business environment, work to create strategic partnerships between employers and ourselves, employers or other community groups. And then we implement those strategies to benefit Central Florida. In terms of career seekers, it's all about engaging the talent pool, finding talent within our county and developing those skills and then crafting the right fit between career seeker and business. Next slide. This was just a quick uh, overview of our locations. If you're in Central Florida, uh, most recently the West office moved to the West Oaks Mall, but if you want to screenshot this and get the addresses down, that's uh, fine. Next slide. Now the details, right? What kind of services we provide? So the business services will be second, but first we'll talk about the career services. These are services that are to the individual. So if you're not a business owner or an entrepreneur, you're just a person who is going through some career transition. Career coaching is available. There's career discovery assessments, uh, resume building workshops, and um, counseling, employment services, and interview skills as well. In terms of training, there's many training solutions. One of the most popular ones are on the job training, um, and then training programs with scholarships for those who meet the eligibility requirements. In addition, there's also soft skills training to prep the career seeker to then enter the job market with confidence and good soft skills. Next slide. 
for our businesses. Uh, I know from primarily everyone here is an entrepreneur or business owner, or at least aspiring to be. Uh, Career Source Central Florida offers these high level, I would say, services to our business owners and entrepreneurs. First, it's recruitment services, right? That's pre-screenings, um, certain hiring events, uh, using the Career Source Central Florida offices as uh, interview locations to interview potential candidates, and also job postings through our Employ Florida network, where everyone in the state could see the posting, your postings, your postings to get free visibility. Like you don't have to go to link, um, LinkedIn or indeed Career Source Central Florida um, has a portal where millions of people will see your postings on Employ Florida. In addition, we offer workforce intelligence. Uh, my team also supports this uh, business solution, which is providing employment data, job and labor market trends, and labor resources to businesses. So, right, that reads really nicely. What that means in, in plain English is that there's labor market data, right? You want to find a sous chef, right, or a head chef. You want to know on average how much does that profession, um, how much does that profession command, and also how many people in the geographic area have that skill set. And so, some of that market intelligence may not be available for each and every employer, but Career Source will help you to get the intelligence you need to identify those individuals that you're targeting to fill those needs to allow you to provide your services and products to our Central Florida customers. Lastly, um, new hire training. There's three types, apprenticeships, internships, and training programs. And so if you have a need for an employee, there's opportunity to partner with Career Source Central Florida to either fund an internship or sponsor um, partial training that's on the job training where the person would work for about 12 years and then a portion of their salary, 12 years, 12, 12 weeks, um, and uh, a portion of their salary would be reimbursed to the employer as sort of an incentive to grow and um, expand. Next slide. Lastly, I have, um, I have on the call here, if there's any questions, uh, Ms. Audrey, who heads, who's the director of our business services department. And she started earlier this year and um, she's really put together a lot of initiatives to strengthen our business services team. What that is, it's a team of individuals who connect with businesses and perform an assessment to identify their needs, their employment needs and opportunities for them to leverage our services and resources. This team is just really trained, highly skilled individuals who assist the business in identifying employees who need upscaling or potential opportunities to um, receive grants or access centers. And that brings my last um, bullet is there's a grant opportunities, both at the state level and at the local level. So at the local level, internships on the job training, which is uh, subsidized by um, career source. And then at the state level, there's disaster relief grants um, because of COVID. Uh, career source has received a, a few grants to work with employers to put people to work. And so working with a business service consultant from our business services team, which is 110% free, um, will allow you to access those services and really grow your business and provide the value that we know you guys wanna to provide to your um, customers. Next slide. So overall, thank you. This is the website for Career Source Central Florida, but like Marcia said- Can I be quiet? Yes. 
Hello? Oh, yeah, like Marnache said, there's a, a career source off office in every part of the state, and there's really no excuse not to leverage the resources and even the information, the wealth of information that career source has available to businesses and entrepreneurs in terms of finding talent, assessing talent in market intelligence. It's there and it's there and it's at your um, disposable, at your disposal free of charge. Thank you. Hey Darby, you did such a great job with that. And I just wanted to add very quickly that for all the individuals that are on the call that it's in the counties that we're currently servicing, we would certainly look forward to being able to connect you with the employers who are seeking uh, to have great talent come aboard. And we're also certainly looking to work with businesses who are looking to connect talent. So if there's anyone who needs a job, we're here for you. And if there's any business that needs any of the programs that Darby was able to explain, we're certainly here to work with you in that regard as well. So I wanted to add that um, to the great introduction that you've done for the business services team. Thank you, Audrey and Darby. Thank you so much. I know that there are some affirmations in the chat. That was really great information. For those of you who are on with us, don't worry about jotting anything down. Ms. Veronica Valdez is actually going to send a recap email of this incredible event to you with all of the resources that we're discussing tonight. So you don't have to worry about writing anything down. We're more focused on every, everyone being really present and listening to all of the fantastic information that we have to offer um, during this Business Leader Summit. So again, thank you to everyone um, that's tuned in and to Audrey and Darby, thank you so much. So you heard from Audrey and Darby about everything that career source throughout the entire state of Florida can do as it relates to soft skills, hard skills, you know, training, um, just different resources that you have. And now I actually want to turn this conversation over to an incredible friend of my family. Um, I think my sister's on and be, we've known Beatrice Lewisant for a very long time. Beatrice is the president and CEO of the Florida State Minority Supplier Development Council. And so without further ado, Beatrice, take it away. Welcome. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I definitely want to first thank Secretary Saul for thinking enough of the Haitian community to host this event and also appreciate Veronica Valdez's um, leadership and Murdoshi. Thank you for serving as such a great um, facilitator, moderator. Um, so appreciate you, my sister. So what I'm going to do is just share a little bit about the organization that I run. If you can go back one, one slide, okay. Um, and a little bit about the services that we have, some upcoming activities that may be of importance to you, and some resources. Additionally, um, at the end of the session, there's going to be a handout um, that Veronica is going to be sending with many of these uh, resources listed on a fact sheet so that you have them and it's easily accessible. Um, I know 2020 was a challenging year for many of us, but particularly minority businesses. And as a Haitian American and an immigrant to this country, we know that many people begin businesses because sometimes it's hard to find employment. And uh, what's true about the Haitian community is just how entrepreneurial we are. We're gonna find a way to make a way and to create jobs. During the pandemic, um, there's been a surge in the start of businesses as much as 82%. So it is a really great time to be in business. Uh, many of us are realizing, hey, we can't count on that job forever. Um, so I'm gonna have my, my gig as well as my job. And there's nothing wrong with that. Some of the best brands were started during a downturn. Uber, Microsoft, HP, Netflix, GE, Disney, all, all companies that were started during a really tough time in the US economy. So I hope that those of you that are out here now listening, listening today, uh, you're well on your way to starting one of those incredible companies that we're gonna be talking about for years to come. I did wanna take a point of privilege. I did notice that Royal Caribbean, Russell Beneford is on the call. Uh, Royal Caribbean is one of our newest corporate members and Vister Communications as well as one of our top minority businesses out of Tampa. So I did wanna just thank them for attending 
today's event. And if there are others who are part of the organization that I don't know that you're on the call, thank you for supporting us. So a little bit about the council. We're a private not-for-profit organization. This is our 46th year in business. We're part of a national organization that's headquartered in New York. And we cover the entire state of Florida. We help Hispanic, Asian, African-American, and Native American-owned companies to grow by certifying them. It's a national certification that's accepted by over 2,500 corporations and government agencies. We advocate on behalf of our minority businesses, both in the public and private sector, to be sure that projects are inclusive of minority businesses. We connect minority firms to opportunities. Annually, we help firms uh, win about a billion dollars in contracts and we help develop them. And I'll be sharing a little bit about how we help develop the companies with some of the programs and services that we have. We talked about certification and again, you'll be receiving a one sheet with, if you're interested in our certification, um, what that, you know, what that requires and who's eligible. We have multiple matchmaking events. Um, our biggest one is our business expo. It's coming up in May. We've got a healthcare forum that's coming up. Uh, we have an event uh, for six weeks with Logitech. They're looking for minority firms in the gaming space and minority firms that can do business uh, with them. Today, I was on a call with Office Depot. They're looking to identify minority suppliers. So many of our events are open to the public, whether you're certified or not, please join us because you'll definitely meet people that are buying your products and services. We have advanced manager programs at Kellogg, Dartmouth, and Washington State University, three of the best business schools in the country where we send our minority businesses for a week to focus on not working in the business, but working on the business. So sometimes you gotta step away to talk about how do you retool, how do you pivot, how do you grow? We have an e-newsletter that we publish every Tuesday that has bids, success stories, articles, opportunities, uh, grants, and so forth. We have a mentor protege program. We provide referrals regularly. Our MBEs can find each other to, to do business with each other, as well as find thousands of companies across the nation that are certified nationally. And we are the um, providers of the state of Florida FDOT specialized development program. The Florida Department of Transportation has one of the largest budgets in the state of Florida. And they're looking for qualified firms, qualified DBEs. Um, and we help primes identify DBEs on projects that are 50 million and larger. So if you're interested in doing business with the Department of Transportation, please reach out to us. Um, during the COVID, construction was still going. Um, construction was considered essential. Construction is, is growing. And if our, if our elected officials in Washington ever pass um, a bill that deals with infrastructure, there's gonna be even more opportunities. So Murdoshi talked about as either being a doctor or a lawyer or a, or a nurse or a teacher, let's also add engineers because we definitely need more engineers. And that's one of the things our parents said, become an engineer because there are gonna be some real incredible opportunities in infrastructure. We also have our own loan fund. Right now we're helping people package their PPP loans. If you don't qualify for PPP, um, for the PPP loans, there are other lending vehicles that we're aware of, alternative sources of financing that we'll help you with. Also, we run the SBA 7J management program that helps companies to do business uh, with government teaching them the skills to do business with government. Government is the biggest buyer in the world. So if you start off small, whether it's a small municipality, the school board, uh, hospital, airport, um, water or sewer department, check out what your government is buying. Um, you pay taxes and there are opportunities and, you know, and, and there are small opportunities too. If you're a first time player in doing business with the government, there are times where all they have to do is get a few quotes and then they award to the lowest bidder. And if you can, if you win several of those, that's a, that's a nice, those are nice size contracts that you could win. A couple of resources, the SBA, as you know, uh, Congress passed a new stimulus 
and their, excuse me, the new uh, COVID package, and there are still loans available, EIDL, as well as PPP that can be a forgivable loan. Um, again, you'll be getting this list of information. We run two minority business development centers, one in Miami, one in Orlando, and we cover the entire state. You can call us and get help from a consultant to help you identify opportunities, to help you with marketing, feasibility, um, helping you with HR. Uh, we, if you're a client of the center, we send you information about opportunities regularly. Also, we put together a COVID, one, one slide back, a COVID resource page. If you were to go onto our website, you'll find a resource page that we update regularly with opportunities, grants, events, webinars, changes to legislation that's really critical so that you can find it all in one place. And then for resources, additionally, during COVID, many cities, counties, private foundations have been providing loans and grants for small businesses. And many of those are forgivable as well. And I've been reading about a lot of companies that are just saying, you know what, let me just put together a GoFundMe page and it's working. So I, I just recently re read about a business in Fort Lauderdale that's raised close to $50,000. And in the state of Florida, we've got some alternative uh, lending organizations, the Florida Business Investment Fund, Action USA, um, you heard about um, EFI's lending program. There's a lot of, of opportunities out there. We just have to find out which ones are right for us. And there are also angel investors. A little harder, you want to take a piece of the business and you want to be careful if that's what's right for you. But there are also angel investors um, out here um, as well. Um, the SBDC is another group of centers around the state that's helping people with um, with helping people with managing their companies and continually to grow and survive during this very challenging time. Want to share with you all a current real hot off the press opportunity. Siemens is giving $20,000 grant to a black business located in Orlando. Uh, working with us in our MBDA center in Orlando. Uh, the deadline is fast approaching. Again, you can go to our website and I'll be putting our site in the chat if you wanna learn more about it and what the eligibility is. But there are uh, several other cities where they're making these grants available just to black businesses. And listen, if you can get a grant, that means you don't have to pay it back. I say apply for everything you can get. Um, we also have a program called the Kaufman Fast Track Program. It's a night, nine week um, training program, really mostly for startups that really want intense support, coaching. We've got some of the best professors, marketing specialists, accountants, lawyers that are going to be providing some incredible service. Now, there is a minimal cost. It's $100, but I, I guarantee you, you'll get a return on investment. And if you pay to attend this and you don't feel you've gotten an ROI, I promise to give you your $100 back. But it's about a $1,500 value. And I, I encourage you, if you're out here, you're thinking about what do I do to really scale? How can I grow exponentially? You want to meet with other entrepreneurs. This is a place to be. Um, being an entrepreneur can be a very lonely place. You know, your family don't understand why you can't, you know, buy that new car or why you're making all these sacrifices. So iron sharpens iron. And here's a great place to, to, to work with other entrepreneurs in terms that are working on growing their companies. And then just some save the dates. We've got a session coming up with the Department of Treasury, how to do business with them. Um, everything you wanted to know about government contracting was afraid to ask. Teaming. One of the ways we're going to definitely get through this difficult time if we have strategic alliances, joint venture partners, um, to be bigger and to hopefully win more opportunities. We are hosting government contracting in March and in August. Our business expo is in May, our impact awards in September. And then in October, and we are all cannot wait to the day that we can all be together 
um, our organization is hosting our national conference. Usually that seven to 8,000 people, the largest corporations, government agencies, minority businesses that are focused on growing uh, minority businesses and doing business and matching them with opportunities. Again, I you know, congratulate you on your entrepreneurial journey. If you're thinking about it, if you're a seasoned entrepreneur, the Florida State Minority Smart Development Council is here to help you. We wanna be your partner in helping you grow your company and we look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Beatrice. We really appreciate you. One of the points that I really wanna emphasize with everyone is Beatrice, I think you sort of went over this, but if you are a business, whether you're an established firm or you're just thinking about getting your business off the ground, it is really, really critical and probably going to be the best thing for you to contact Beatrice and become either a DBE, a WBE, or an MBE. So what are all those acronyms? Women business, uh, woman-owned business enterprise, uh, disadvantaged business enterprise, and then uh, minority business enterprise, uh, enterprise. If you become an MBE, a DBE, or a WBE, the contracts that can come your way are so much more possible simply because you know you have that designation. So I would really encourage everyone to get in touch with the council. Um, a lot of the resources, I know that Veronica and some others are, are placing them in the chat, but really, really, really try to get as involved as you can. If you're really, really serious about your business, it's time there's, you know, there's an opportunity for you to make some different, different moves. I think we say, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So if you want a different result for your business, then you got to do something different. And the point of this summit is to provide you with as much or as many, excuse me, resources as we possibly can to ensure the success of your business enterprise. Because when you win, we all win, right? Um, before we move on to, I think, our long-awaited panel, I do want to acknowledge the Haitian American Chamber of Commerce of Florida, Paula Pierre, who leads that incredible organization. I think I saw Jeff Lazama in the chat earlier. Carl, there are a couple of chamber, uh, chamber board members that are on. Thank you so much for your support. As all of you know, based on the flyer, the Haitian American Chamber of Commerce of Florida is actually a sponsor of this incredible business summit. So to Paula, to the board members, thank you so much for your support. And I also encourage anyone, if you're in the South Florida area and you are not involved in uh, the Haitian American Chamber, sign up, become a member today. If you are not in the South Florida area, if you're in Central Florida or wherever you are, identify and try to find the chamber in your area and become an active member. I cannot tell you or stress enough how important it is for you to have a village around you to support your endeavor. So again, to Paula, to everyone else that's on, thank you so much for your support. And now, without further ado, I know that everyone on this uh, Business Summit uh, Zoom is really excited about our panel. I am too. So let me tell you all how this is going to go. We are not going to have, you know, seven or six different tiles on your screen um, and asking random questions. This is going to be very sort of rapid fire, fireside chat, maybe. Um, but what we wanted to do was really give the rock stars that you're going to hear from their due time to explain to you what you need to do for your business and give them an opportunity to really explain their expertise. So whether it's legitimizing your business, whether it's finding capital, whether it's how to market your business, whether it's a family owned venture, or maybe you're not even here, maybe you're in the Bahamas, you're, maybe you're in Haiti, maybe you're somewhere else and you, you're interested in relocating your business. We're gonna talk about all of that on our panel. So without further ado, the first uh, subject that we're going to talk about is legitimizing our business. So I want to call Miss uh, uh, Attorney, I should say, Michelle Austin Pammies to the stage. I'm going to have her introduce herself. But one of the things that we want to do is really tell a story to everyone who's on here. So all of the subjects that we're going to talk about tonight are all going to be um, connected. What we're going to attempt to do here with our first session with Attorney uh, Austin Pammies is all of us on this call know someone who has a side hustle or what we refer to as a side hustle or something that they're doing to earn extra income. However, if you were to go to sunbiz.org, you wouldn't be able to find that business. Um, they're probably not insured. And so what we want to kick off this conversation or this panel talking about is really how to legitimize your business. 
And so I want to go ahead and call up uh, Michelle. Michelle is already on attorney Austin Pammies. And so Michelle, for our viewers that are on from here, there, and everywhere, who is Michelle Austin Pammies? I'll try to give you Michelle Austin Pammy. <laughs> no, no. Thank you, Murdoshi. I am a Haitian American mother of two adult sons, primarily, yes. who's quite engaged in her community, whether it be with the Women of Color organization where I'm on the board. Um, the, we, we just talked about the Haitian American Chamber of Commerce where I'm on yes. the advisory board. I've been just basically an active member of my community. I'm now on the Women's Fund Board, Law Alumni Board, and my practice is uh, for the University of Miami. And my practice primarily right now is focused on the representation of municipalities. I say that because we serve as outside city attorneys right. for various cities in South Florida and do also commercial litigation for businesses and business transactions. So my background was primarily in business transactions. I started at the firm where Jean Wilson started <laughs> and he was there before me and he was kind of a, a mentor because when I called him up, I said, Jean, I heard you used to work for this firm. Just tell me what's going on. And he was there and we remain friends to this day. So this is my general background. We could get into the nitty gritty of legal issues affecting businesses when you're ready. Absolutely, thank you so much, Michelle. So for someone wanting to start a business, right? We just talked about someone's having a side hustle. What are some basic legal steps that someone would need to take in order to legitimize their business? Well, generally you can start a business by just being a sole proprietor. So you could go out there and you say, I have a business. You could register a DBA, say, I'm gonna call the business Michelle's Hair Salon and move on. And so that's something that's possible and your social security number is used. But generally people structure a business differently in order to determine how much risk they're willing to take. Right. So if you're going to have a partner, you could just decide, hey, we'll have a partnership 50-50, let's do this together, get a DBA. But the thing is that it's better from a risk perspective to consider limiting your liability. So therefore mm -hmm. people consider the different options out there, a limited liability company, right? Which means that your money isn't mixed with the business. It's really the business right? Um, that could be protected so that if there's something that happens and there's a lawsuit, you know that the money that's in the business is the only money that's at issue, not your private residence, et cetera, et cetera. So you could do that through a limited liability company. You could do that through a corporation. And um, those are the main forms that people use. Okay, there are others, but these are the main two types. And right now, limited liability companies are very popular because of the taxation issue. Right. And um, if you want to get into it further, the key is you want to be protected from liability. You form an entity. And if you have a partner, instead of just having a partnership that's undefined and you have to find out what the law is in the partnership laws you have a document called an operating agreement that says clearly what the responsibilities of each party is and what the expectations are and if you have a, a corporation then you have a shareholders agreement you have bylaws that dictates how things are governed and now you're in real business instead of um, you know kind of taking things by chance risking right. so much no, that's good. So we know, obviously, we, you know, we did a little bit of talking about COVID earlier, but unfortunately and regrettably, a lot of people did either were laid off or did lose their jobs. And so what they turned to was entrepreneurship. You know, some, some people might call that a blessing. So, you know, someone, let's say, you know, someone is looking to make some money. They have a fantastic product that they want to put on the market. What are some of the legal issues that they should take into account before putting their, their product or their service out in the market? Well, we talked about forming an entity and having a structure, um, mm -hmm. a legal structure. That's one thing. The other thing to consider is when you say product, what does that mean? Is a product something that you've developed that's right. unique? Is it something where you may need a patent? Mm. And is it something that you need to verify whether someone else has a patent? Is that is it that type of complicated product? Right. Okay. Right. Right. If it's a more simple product, that may not be an issue. 
But at the same time, what you need to consider is, okay, what is the product name? What is the name I'll be using for the product? You may have a trademark that you'd like to register. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, when you're, when we, you're putting a product out there, you're developing a business plan of some type, right? You have a marketing plan. All these things are critical. But from a legal standpoint, you have to understand whether or not the product is something that is patentable, whether or not you need to have a trademark for the product, because when you're marketing it, you'd like to protect it. You may want to protect it so that nobody else replicates what you're doing. So right, right. now you put it out, you're calling it beauty water. Um, you want to know if somebody else is having a beauty water product out there, because if so, you could have liability if you go out right. there and, and market it yourself. So there are searches to be had and um, those types of issues to consider as a preliminary. No, no, of course, of course. Um, so let's say beauty water. I've been in business for four years and now I have some employees or I, I'm considering hiring employees because Michelle, I cannot do this alone anymore. What are some issues that I should take account at the onset when hiring employees? I think that's a very important issue because first of all, do you want employees? You can have independent contractors. Depends on what your business is. For example, you might say, I'm not going to have employees. I am going to have contracts where I have an independent contractor, mm -hmm. but there are terms to respect, right? Because in order for someone to be an independent contractor, the person has to be working independently. They can't right. really be under your supervision and control. So you have a contract with that person and the person goes out and sells product for you, for example, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and they get paid a commission. That's one relationship. Um, if you decide to have employees, you have to realize that there are a lot of legal considerations because first of all, if you have four or more employees in the state of Florida, then you get into, well, you have to consider providing them with unemployed um, workers' compensation that you have to be able to pay for that. Um, they have to have that coverage. It's a requirement of the law. There are a variety of labor required postings that you have to post um, for your employees. Right. You also have to consider employment taxes. And when you, when you consider that someone is your employee, unemployment comp becomes an important issue because somebody may appear to be an independent contractor, at least you thought so when you signed an agreement, but the facts show that they, they are under your supervision and control. They come to your office at set hours, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then unemployment comp downstream deems that you should have been paying unemployment compensation for them because they are in fact your employees and you're still liable. Wow. So when looking at employees, it's a major consideration for a business as, it, as it's evolving. Do you want to become um, a business that has employees for or more? understanding the liability associated with it and having the right, not just legal counsel, but accountants to advise you in how to structure yourself to make sure that you're not incurring liability. Right. And uh, remember also employees can file lawsuits against you just like anybody else. Yeah. And at some point the employee recognized that, well, even though you're calling me an independent contractor, now that you just told me you're fired, I want unemployment comp, wow. right? So they can pursue that and other issues. You need to really have your ducks in a row when you're transitioning to that more significant business where you're hiring employees and understanding the liabilities that arise. At that point, you need advice. Don't just Google it. At that point, you need to find someone out there with the knowledge base to give you the right guidance. Now, I appreciate that, Michelle. So you you told us, you know, we needed to figure out if Beauty Water was going to either be a limited liability company or a sole proprietorship. You know, you talked to us about, you know, um, does someone have the same name as Beauty Water? Maybe there's Beauty underscore Water or Beauty Fantasy Water or what have you. So you talked about, you know, making sure that the name was available. Um, is our product or service uh, patentable? You know, you also talked to, to us about employees, you know, whether we can be sued or whether we can be legally liable for something that they're doing. 
our time is up, Michelle. However, if someone on this business summit wants to get in touch with you, how can they do that? I know that Veronica put it in there, but there may be someone who just came in and doesn't have your email address. So how can we get in touch with you, Michelle? Did we lose Michelle? Maybe we lost her, but that's okay. We're gonna go ahead and move on. I think Veronica did put um, Michelle's information in the chat. And so we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next panelist. Um, again, another friend. I'm so excited to have Newton Sandin here who's gonna talk to us about finding capital and generating revenue. We're so excited. Newton, how are you this evening? <laughs> I'm great. Thank you for having me. How are you? I am fantastic. Thank you so much for being with us. Again, we're going to talk about finding capital and generating revenue. So who is Newton Sandin? Let us know who you are. And of course, I know that in your introduction, you're going to talk about OIC. Of course. So thank you for having me. I too want to acknowledge Secretary Powell for putting this together and recognizing the vast contribution of Haitian Americans in entrepreneurial space. And so I want to thank um, all of you all for making this happen. Uh, again, Newton Sandin, president and CEO of an organization, OIC of South Florida. I'll talk about it just a little bit. Uh, born and raised in Miami, Florida. Uh, my parents, like most of us on this call, are from Haiti, specifically the Northwest area, La Tati, La Pointe, San Luis de Nord area. And so certainly a proud heritage there. Uh, like Michelle, very active in the community. Uh, shout out to my sister, Beatrice. Um, we both serve on the Orange Bowl Committee together. Uh, B was the first Haitian American woman to serve on this 85 year history or historical organization. I'm wow. the first Haitian American male to serve on the Orange Bowl Committee. Uh, serve on the board of the Beacon Council, the county's economic development organization for Miami Dade, and serve on the board for the Alliance, uh, the same organization in, uh, in Broward County. So. Uh, outside of that, one that just believes in lifting as I climb, serving the community, helping people realize their fullest potential. And so that's that's who I am. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here again. My pleasure. Okay, just talk to us about, you know, what to do to legitimize our venture, right? Um, so I want to talk about capital. So I have a fantastic product. I'm going to use the same example, Beauty Water. <laughs> I've registered Beauty Water. Um, and I want to build the legitimacy of beauty water, but I need money. I need capital. What should I consider before seeking funding or raising capital? So that, that's the biggest question. And I think the most understated opportunity uh, that once again, be talked about. Uh, the first thing is to recognize is so raising capital is the aspiration. And mm -hmm. I always say that aspiration without preparation leads to frustration. Yes. And so what does it mean to be prepared? Uh, the first thing is you got to recognize bank, banks are a business. They're in business to generate revenue and they have to mitigate risk when they're considering funding you. So what does it mean to be prepared? The first thing I say to folks is oftentimes the value proposition of most small businesses, we're really good at making our pate, our griot, combing hair, doing that whole thing. <laughs> yeah. But it's the infrastructure of the organization that companies and banks and lending institutions are looking for. Do you have financials? Uh, do you have an established corporation of which most times they want an established corporation to be in business for at least two years? Do you have a governing board of directors to give you some guidance? So there are the technical elements that a lending institution may look for, but, but don't kid yourself about, they're also assessing your brand. And I always say to people so often that it's so important to make sure you continue to navigate and negotiate yourself. Uh, I said, me and I serve on the Orange Bowl Committee, one of the most statute organizations in South Florida. And you have CEOs from all the major corporations. And so those networks always, th those networks are your assets. You know, right. I have the president of Truist Bank on my board. Uh, that relationships helps me expedite, you know, getting certain deals. So to recap, one solid financials, and that could be subjective. So certainly every organization needs to assess what that means for them and the kind of levels of lending that you're looking for. And then secondarily, another plug for Beatrice, the county, Dade and Broward County. To give you an example, Broward County has a billion dollar pot 
for DBEs, mm -hmm. SBEs that you talk about. But yeah. here's the most important thing I want to say to people about that. I talked to the director last week. They oftentimes cannot realize the billion dollar spending because folks aren't prepared. So right. again, aspiration aligned with preparation is the formula for success. That's awesome. That's amazing. I hope folks are, we're going to send this out. I, and I think that this summit is being recorded, but hopefully for those of you that are like me that, you know, you learn by writing, I hope you, you got that. Um, so you talked about being prepared. And one of the things that I think a lot of businesses run into is, and I think, you know, Michelle mentioned this earlier is, you know, people, when they first get in a business, they start to co-mingle personal funds with business funds and everything is just a mess. How important is it to have pristine financials as a business? So obviously the term pristine is subjective, right? right. Subjective within the context of if you're looking to borrow $100 from a bank, you may not necessarily need pristine financials. Right. And so that's a subjective term. Mm -hmm. but, but what I would say to people oftentimes, again, you know, you have to make sure that when you ask for a certain amount of funding, you have a governing structure, you have a, a legitimate corporation and said state that you're operating in. That's the first thing they're gonna look into. And then I think you have to contextualize the amount of money you're asking for in relation to what your financials look like. Because it's all about mitigating risk. So to give you a finite answer is hard to do because every scenario will be different. different Obviously, right. if you're asking for a million dollars, they're gonna be looking for a certain level of ratios with your balance sheet. Mm -hmm. um, but here's the most important thing too. I think a lot of people get daunted by that preparedness. One of the biggest things we just simply don't do is we don't partner and collaborate with each other, right? Maybe yes. it's a trust thing, whatever it is. If you great at making the pate, if you great at fixing cars and whatever you do, that's okay, do that, right? But if you partner with another small business is a, a strong accounting arm, together, let you and your say say force, right? You partner with that, that, that accounting firm you call Michelle Pamis, who can help you on the legal side. Together, right. you guys establish an agreement to estimate what preparedness looks like. And yes, you could be the lead on that project, but you guys can work together because a whole lot of something is a whole lot better than you know trying to go after a contract and not having any resources, not being able to get it at all. So critical, you know, Newton, what you just shared because sometimes I think, you know, no man is an island, right? And so a lot of times we get the entrepreneurship, we don't know what we're doing, but we we just want to do it ourselves. And I think, you know, what everyone can pretty much take from this conversation is you do need a village. You need, a, a you know, some folks around you who know what they're doing, maybe a separate set of folks who are pushing you and encouraging you to do what you need to do, and then some other folks to really keep everything correct. Um, so let's pivot a little bit. So on the other side, if I am JP Morgan or I'm Bank of America or I'm One United Bank, what do funders look for prior to funding a business? Yep, I think it's similar to the previous question, but I would say they're looking at how do I mitigate the risk? And I think you just gotta ask yourself, uh, I do a lot of self and introspection, right? Mm -hmm. When I'm going after a deal, uh, excuse the personal reference, but for example, our organization, we've raised $80 million to date. Right. Uh, since March, we've had probably one of our best years in the downturn of an economy. We raised $14 million since March. Wow. I say that not to tout, but hopefully to give you some encouragement that it is possible. But we progressively established ourselves as a, as, a, as a credible brand. Right. And so I think it's important for you to think about how are you doing that? First and foremost, an established corporation that's legitimate. Have you been in business for at least two years is typically the trend. And there are several mechanisms to get funding. One, you can go traditional routes with your banks. Secondarily, you can partner with organizations uh, like the Florida State Minority Supply Diversity Council, where at the DBE, et cetera, uh, oftentimes what will happen is, you know, the states, counties, and even the feds via the 8A status will have these set aside for minority women-owned businesses Right. And they have a different perspective about what preparedness looks like. I'll tell you, again, most of our funds come from the federal government, and that's been intentional in our strategic endeavors. But I talk to my colleagues at the feds, and they literally say to me, not millions, but billions of dollars, literally with a B, billions of dollars go back to the federal coffers every year for DB and MB and AD status folks. 
because folks either don't apply at all because they're intimidated by the process or apply and are not prepared. I think a lot of people saw that even with the PVP opportunities. Folks just ran to try to get the money. Once again, you aspired for it, but you weren't prepared. prepared so, right. but, I, but, I, but I encourage everybody on this call because clearly the mere fact that on a Wednesday evening, you saw it appropriate to invest your time on this gathering suggests to me that you guys are interested, you're motivated and, tr- and aspiring to be prepared for these endeavors. But please, I would just strongly encourage you guys so much money goes back to state, local, and county entities. And there is, in this day and age, absolutely zero, zero reasons for you not to be to get your share of the pie. Organizations like Broward County Small Business and Economic Development Division, Miami-Dade has the same, Beatrice Organization, the Beacon Council, who you'll hear from later on. These folks are sometimes literally pleading for folks Career source, another phenomenal resource that you heard earlier are from, from the Central Florida area. I worked with the Dayton Brown Career Source since uh, 19 years ago when I started my corporation. They will give you dollars to train your people. They will pay for up to six months of their salary in some instances. Wow. They will give you dollars to train your staff in different segments and disciplines. So guys, there are so many resources out there Um, And our last part, as I close out this segment, remember something, folks, it starts with you and it will end with you. Nobody's going to take care of your baby like you, just no one. And so if you invest the time and effort, uh, the sky is the limit. Newton Stannon, thank you so much. President and CEO of OIC South Florida, thank you so much for being with us this evening. And my take is preparedness. So thank you so much. My pleasure. All right, let's bring up again, another friend. We have so many friends on this, uh, during this summit, um, but someone who I respect a great deal, um, really good friend. She co pastor she's an incredible chief creative officer of Cool Creative. And, and of course I'm talking about Joanne Wilson. Um, I, I cannot say enough truly about Joanne. Um, I, sis, I'm not going to steal your thunder. We're just going to go right into these questions. And I don't know if Terrence is on, but I'm just going to shout him out because this is being recorded. And because I love you and your husband so much, Terrence, if you're watching, hi, how are you? Miss you both so much. Let's get right into it. So, Joanne, you are, I mean, if I could say it, you know, plainly, Renaissance woman, and I, and I truly mean that. So for everyone on this, you know, in this summit that doesn't know you, who is Joanne Wilson, the co-founder, chief creative director of Cool Creative? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you again for inviting me to be part of this. Thank you to Secretary Sal for putting this on as well. Um, And shout out to my family, Sandra, who's on here. That's my Terrence's uh, cousin. So therefore, she's my cousin. And so um, just being on this panel Um, with so many uh, powerhouses is an honor. Um, So definitely salute to you all and thank you for everything that you are um, imparting on the audience. Well, I am first and foremost, a child of the most high God. Um, I'm a daughter of Haitian natives. I'm a wife to Terrence. I'm a mother to Valencia, who's a 10 year old who thinks she runs the world, but I'm not gonna- Baba. <laughs> I'm a dreamer, I'm an executor, artist, optimist, risk taker. I think so many of us are. Um, after all that, yes, I am an entrepreneur that runs um, Cool Creative, which, is, uh, which started out as just a branding firm um, that did visual branding, uh, design, web design, all that great stuff. And, um, and then we, we, tur- we became also a fashion brand. Basically, we became our own client. Um, <laughs> and, and I love, and I definitely um, am a woman who was influenced by so many strong women. I'm surrounded yes. by strong women. I'm surrounded by a mother who's an activist for orphans and women in prison, an aunt who's a, a VP of a global executive a uh, uh, financial firm. Um, my my aunts, several of them are breast cancer survivors, but yet they mm. run other businesses. 
I mean, this is the blood that runs through me. So when you say, who am I? That's who I am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, for, for those of you on here, because I don't think I announced our session, Joanne, but, you know, we talked to Michelle about legitima legitimizing your venture. We talked to Newton about capital. And now Joanne is going to talk to us all about marketing and partnerships because it truly is what, what you all do best. I, I couldn't be more proud. And I'm sure everyone who knows you says the same. I can be on Instagram. If I'm strolling and I see anything cool creative is doing, I'm going to repost, retweet, share it out because you all are doing such amazing things. So um, I guess I'll start here. So, you know, much of marketing is about appealing to the consumer, right? And creating a consistent brand identity that people can rely on and people can identify. So tell us about Cool Creative and its genesis and how you've been able to create a globally, not nationally, globally recognized brand. Well, first of all, cool stands for create out of love. Um, mm -hmm. It's not just a cool name, but we uh, really thought about what that meant for us. And um, one day my mother was sick and I was working at, I was working for people. I was working at a, a design firm and my mother got sick one day out of the blue and um, I was in the doctor's office. I had to leave work and, you know, to mm -hmm. go tend to her. And I'll never forget getting a phone call from my boss who said, who pretty much asked me if I had my laptop with him, with me. Wow. He didn't ask me how my mother was. Wow. He didn't, you know, that just what he, he had, you know, whatever it is that was on his mind. And he mm. just he wanted to know if I had my laptop with him. That's when I said, you know what? I can't work for people. Like I, I th this, this cannot be my life. And so that became the beginning of the itch of, you know, the <laughs> entrepreneurship itch. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and, and that's what I did not too long after that I resigned and um, I, I didn't have much of a plan, but I knew that I was going to do something. Um, but eventually I started getting some freelance clients and, and then built the company from there. Uh, it, like I said, it started out as a brand firm um, that did strategic positioning, graphic brand identity design, web designs, and we worked with nonprofits, um, travel and hospitality industries. Um, and my, my, my husband, um, both of us, we met in, in art school. So we're, we are classically trained artists. Um, so one time, you know, there was a period of time several years ago where he was drawing, he's a professional illustrator and a master's of uh, fine arts. So he decided to draw iconic people, uh, mm -hmm. you know, world changers in his spare time as if we really have spare time, right? <laughs> he drew <laughs> like, you know, notable people, um, Nelson Mandela, MLK, Coretta Scott King, Angela Davis, and then, you know, the name goes, the names go on. And his idea was really to teach my daughter about these important people um, because, you know, she needs to know these things. So she also understands where she comes from. And so, um, so that was his idea, but I had other plans. <laughs> I, I, I took those drawings and I was like, yo, those would look super dope on some, you know, apparel, some clothing. And that's what I did. I put them on clothing. I put them up on social media to see if people would like them. They sold out, did that mm -hmm. a couple more times, sold out. And then I was like, hmm, maybe we have something here. Yeah. Uh, it took a while, it took a couple of years before I really took it seriously because, you know, it's, 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 you know, a, a, a passion project. And, mm -hmm. and then that ended up turning into where we are today. That's amazing. And for those of you who just heard Joanne talk about the icon, so directly behind her, she has some really incredible Letterman black jackets. And if you see, if you can see the little white circles, those, those are the icons that she's talking about. And I know Cool Creative also, you, you have um, t-shirts, you have sweaters. I mean, the list goes on, but just wanted to sort of point that out for folks that are watching. Um, so, so let's pivot to marketing. So I, I have, and I'm gonna use again, Beauty Water as my reference. Beauty Water. What are the top three to five marketing elements every business should have or business, business owner should have? Every entre entrepreneur should have the following. You need a brand identity system. This mm. is not just a logo. It, the, the logo is just the beginning of it. It's a part of it, but there should be a system. So um, even the logo has a system. How do you, you can't just have the one logo and it work for everything. So there has mm. to be 
you know, we create these brand guidelines. So if you're putting it on, I don't know, uniforms, a car, a pen, um, letterhead, they're all going to be different. So really right. understanding how that identity works as a system. You want to have branded photography. So photography that you're not grabbing from stock. You can start with stock, but I'm a big proponent. And if you are going to build a brand, everything mm -hmm. needs to be distinctive. That's what branding yes. is all about. Distinctive. Yes. And so there may be instances where you can finesse a stock photo so that it has you know, your brand elements in it, which I've done before, like I'll switch out, like, you know, if they're wearing something, I'll switch out and put like a cool logo on it or something like that. <laughs> yeah. It's more own, own, you know, it, it, it feels like it comes from you, but you want to have your own branded photography that has the essence of what your brand is all about. You want video content. Video content is even more engaging than um, imagery. Uh, I think the the statistic last that uh, the, the last statistic I read was like people um, respond to videos about seven hundred percent more than they do images. Yes, so you definitely want to have video content, and that can look like testimonials. That can be your founder story. All those behind the scenes. You want to have also copy and language. So yes. How do, speak, how do you express your what? What, what do your ads look like? How do you speak? How do you um, express your, your business in words? I love to always um, have, like I create manifestos for clients that we work with. Manifestos are pretty much like, it, it, they describe why your organization exists, its purpose, why should people should care about the brand. And it's yes. usually very like emotional. So you know, Nike does a really good job at those. You can Google that, like Nike manifesto, Apple manifesto. And by the time you're done reading that manifesto, you're like, yeah, give me everything you got. <laughs> you, know, that's, you know, that's always a good way also for you to pull out sort of the essence of your language and your voice as a brand. So those mm -hmm. are some of the critical, and I guess number five would be a website, but you cannot have a website if you don't have the above thing. Right. Don't have right. copy and language, imagery, video, brand. What are you gonna put on your website? Yeah, that that's that's an excellent point because I think all of us have probably either know someone or you've gone to a site where you're like, wait, you sold me on the product. But to your point, Joanne, like there isn't a brand story, there isn't any identity behind it, and that's so critical. Um, so so here I am. I'm just gonna shout you out because this is just what we do, and you know we're family. So, so when you think about your top three wins at Core Creative, and you have a ton of them, so I'm just going to brag on you and Terrence just a little bit. So we're talking about, you know, Rock Nation campaign for, for Rhapsody, who's a rapper, um, the collaboration with Cotton during New York Fashion Week, the redesign for Creole Essence. So for everyone who is, you know, excited about L'Huile Mascouti and Creole Essence, hello, you got the person who was responsible for their redesign and their rebrand right here in front of you. So when you think about, I know I, I mentioned three, when you think about the top three wins at Cool, what would what would you say they are? I mean, those are great ones. Um, I would echo the Rock Nation partnership. And why yes. I love that one so much is not just Rock Nation, which is a huge entity, um, but how it happened. I literally DM'd Rhapsody on Instagram and rest <laughs> wow. So wow. that's another thing, you know, if I, I know like when we talk about marketing, it is very expensive, but there are some bold things that you can do to get around that price tag that marketing usually takes. But um, then it's our wholesale business uh, growth. Mm -hmm. we, we have gotten into some, um, you know, national, uh, stores that are all over the country, national, yes, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> well, um, and I'm really excited about that because that's something that we've been trying to do for a long time. And we got there during the pandemic, go figure, wow. right? When wow. we're supposed to be, you know, uh, scaling back, we had to scale up. So I'm really excited about that. And lastly, the fact that I am sitting in yes. our store, this is yes. our our first location. Her flagship. Yes. It's a flagship and it's our, it's, it's a showroom, but it's also retail. I'm really excited about that. And I'm even more excited that it is in Little Haiti. I was yes. really 
to know about that and hiring a Haitian seamstress to help us bring our ideas to life. So I'm trying to keep it as Haitian as possible. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, Joanne. So, so last question for you, you know, for, for the entrepreneurs that are on the line who, you know, maybe we don't have the capital to invest in marketing or, you know, we just don't have it right at, at right now. We don't have it right now. What are three cost effective ways that people can market their good or their service? And I think you mentioned one because you talked about DMing Rhapsody directly. Oh, yeah. What would you say are top three cost effective ways to market? Okay, so email campaigns are always great. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you but of course you have to have emails, right? So yeah, how right. do you get those emails? And right. so there could be things like you can do pop-ups and, and, um, and if you're gonna be on social media, um, maybe you can do some contests where people have to submit their email addresses in order to be eligible. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody talked about, Newton talked about partnerships. Maybe you're not partnering as a business, but maybe you want to do a partnership on social media. Maybe you have, like for us, we're a clothing brand. We are doing a partnership next month for Black History Month with a Black sunscreen line. And so yes. Black sunscreen line has like, over 100,000 followers, they're known everywhere, they're in Target and everything, and we're going to be cross-promoting. So you look for brands that are that complement yours, not compete, but complement yours, and see if there's sort of a, um, a partnership promotion that you guys can do together. And then there are other things like um, Clubhouse is a new platform that's out. Yes. It takes a little bit to, to kind of understand and finesse your, your way through there, but I've gotten several connections through there and placements and stylists. So you can, you can use that. It's a free platform. It's new. And mm -hmm. because it's new, is you're, you have access to a lot of very important people. So those are a few things. I can give you a lot more, but in the interest of time, and we're not doing yes. Asian time today. <laughs> Joanne, thank you so much. If, you know, for those folks that are on the line that said, you know, hey, maybe I, I, I do have the capital to, to hire Cool Creative, how can they reach you? Well, um, you can reach me at uh, coolcreativeinc.com, inc.com. So coolcreativeinc.com. And if you um, want to venture into some of this casual transitional wear <laughs> that we have, come visit us in Little Haiti at 300 Northeast 62nd Street or online at shopcoolcreative.com. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you so much for being here. It's always a pleasure and have a wonderful evening. <laughs> much. <laughs> All right, folks, we're almost, we're almost to the end. We have two more incredible panelists. So we talked about legitimizing your venture. We talked about how to get capital. We talked about how to market. Now I wanna to turn to family ventures because of course, sometimes when our families come over, you know, maybe we don't have the capital or the wherewithal to launch our own venture. And so we start something internally. And again, we, don't, we might not have the money to hire someone. And so we employ our family members. So I wanna bring uh, Sandra St. Amon to the stage, if you will. And what we're gonna talk about is the benefits of a family owned business. So if Sandra, hi Sandra, how are you? Like I fed, like I fed. Like I fed. And you know, you have a special place in my heart cause we're Sauron. So, you know, Sandra, she, she's a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Oh. You know, I have a special place <laughs> in my heart for you. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. Um, let's go ahead and get to it. So for those of us who are on, you know, on this business summit and we are unfortunately living under a rock and we have never heard of Pac Villa, who is Sandra St. Amon and, and tell us about Pac Villa. Well, I'm going to make them know the trouble now because I'm going to make them know the trouble now because I'm going to make them know the trouble now because I'm going to make them know the trouble now because I'm going to make them know the trouble now because I'm going to <laughs> so I'm just letting you know right now, I'm going to catch a little bit of heat. Okay, I'm just yes, letting y'all know that right now. All right. But Radoshi, I want to thank you so much for having me here. Secretary Sal, and last but not least, my girl, Veronica Faldez, yes. uh, who personally invited me. That's my girl. Um, for those of you uh, who don't know, I'm Sandra St. Amon. I am second generation uh, licensed funeral director, uh, Ann and Bomber at Pax Villa USA Funeral Homes, uh, born and raised uh, in Miami. I um, 
my father is from Porto Pé, so we got Porto Pé people online. Give a shout out. Papa That's right. Porto Pé, Porto Pé, Porto Pé. All right. Um, I um, got a bachelor's degree in criminal justice, a master's degree in public administration. So um, I was on my way to law school because I always, always wanted to be an attorney. But some bat kone, pam de pan avion, ki de Miami, went to Tallahassee because I graduated from the Florida a &M University. Konya li shita la li di, bon, gen business, pitit mo yon pan business, sim da mouri, you guys would have to be forced to sell the business. Mba du pap jam avoka, mba du jam juzno, but I want you to understand the business. So in case if I were to close my eyes, the business would not have to be sold. You would be yeah. able to run the business. So here I am, 22 years later, a yes. licensed criminal director and embalmer. But you know, Haitian parents. Like, oh, who got to juju? Who got to juju? Who got to Of course. But my dad, Jean Jean Saint Amand, who founded Pactville in 1994 and has guided the company through incredible growth with yes. funeral homes in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Orlando, New Jersey. And we have become premier pro uh, leading providers of high quality and standards of funeral and cremation services here at Pax Villa Funeral Homes. Amazing, Sandra, thank you so much. So, you know, you mentioned it this earlier before. You said you were on your way, well on your way to becoming a judge or an attorney. So clearly you took mm -hmm. it. Obviously, of course, we know that your, you know, your parents had, had a, a, you know, role to play in that. Um, tell us, what are the benefits of going into business with family? Well, the benefits, um, we support we support each other. The support, the supporting each other is a big thing without competition. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. Helping each other uh, to succeed. So basically, if you if you win, we win big. Mm. Uh, being being disciplined, um, you know, those are just those are the main benefits. That's incredible. Um, you know, you, you talked about something earlier and I, I think maybe it might've gone over some people's heads. So for those of you who didn't hear Sandra before, she not only is a licensed funeral director and embalmer in Orlando, Miami, et cetera, but Pac Villa is a multinational business, right? Offices in, or, or funeral homes in Miami, Oakland Park, New York, Palm Beach, Orlando, Port uh, Port-au-Prince. How do you navigate those family dynamics, Sandra? Because clearly, you know, you're in family, you know, you're in business with your family. How do you navigate the dynamics? Well, you got to, you got to keep the lines clear, okay? Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, business is business. Right. Uh, it can be very difficult, but it's a choice that you have to make early on. Um, we stay, you know, it's, it's not, it's not easy. It's definitely, yeah. definitely, definitely not easy. Um, each of us, um, we know our gifts and our specialties. So therefore we have the ability to uh, lean on each other. For example, yes. my strengths would be, uh, communication and developing relationships for the families. Mm -hmm. My brother's strength, my, he's the negotiator. So if I need anything negotiated, <laughs> I call him to negotiate. Yes. So we all come in with our different uh, talents and, you know, and gifts and specialties. And therefore it's, it's a great feeling because we're able to lean on, on each other for that. each other. Right. You know, when we think about funeral homes and we think about, you know, your particular business, you know, it, it's not necessarily a happy business, right? Um, funerals are not happy business. We, you know, we, we count on organizations and businesses like yours, like Pac Vila to, you know, help us bring dignity to our loved ones who have passed on. You know, regrettably last year, um, you lost the matriarch of your of your family. You lost your mom. Um, I cannot imagine um, the toll that it, it took on you. Talk to us about how you were able to stay grounded and grieve through that difficult life event of losing your mom when it hit so close to home. So when when you know honoring the life of folks is so is your business. Tell us how you were impacted by her passing and how you were able to stay grounded. Um, well, it hit home. That yeah. I will say that. Yeah. When you are sitting in the front row, mm. 
whole different story. That's okay. Right. That's totally right. different. Um, losing my mother is a pain that you cannot explain. Yeah. Okay. Only those who have lost the mother, who have lost the father, can relate to what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is that I will grieve forever. Yes. Um, I will never be able to get over the loss of my mother, but I will learn to live with it. Mm -hmm. um, this job is a ministry for me. And I know that God placed me in this business here. So now when families, when families come here and they lose their mother and they lose their father, I can relate. I right. can relate. And that has actually helped me in the grieving process because yeah. I know I'm not alone and they're not alone. Right. Okay. So it's just, it's just amazing how God has a way of doing things. And we, you know, we, 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 we want to question him, but we can't. And we know right. that everything, everything happens for a reason. Um, so, you know, I will be whole again, but I will never be the same. Yeah. And I mean, on behalf of all of us, Sandra, you know, our, our condolences, it, it happened last year, but to your point, you can never, the pain of losing a parent is, is a tough one. Mm. And many of us on this call have, or on this, you know, on the summit have probably lost a parent. And so definitely appreciate you um, for being candid and being transparent about that. Um, I'll, I'll give you one last question before we pivot to our last, uh, our last panelist. You know, in a family venture, it's easy for the lines to get blurred, right? So when you're in business with family, you know, oh, that's, that's, that's Sandra, you know, oh, Miss Alapfe. And it's easy for those lines to get blurred. How critical is personal and professional development when you're in business with family? Is that me? Mm. Well, like I said before, business is business. My dad loves all his children, although they all think that I'm daddy's favorite, which I really am, but you know, business is business. Um, like I said before, keeping the, line, keeping the lines clear. Um, yeah. My dad has been my greatest influencer. He's been the innovator. He is the visionary. He is the mastermind behind mm -hmm. this business who paved uh, the way for all his children. Um, right. He trained us young, um, to be honest, he trained us young to work hard. He trained us young to be respectful. He trained us young to, to know the importance of education. He trained us to be courteous and providing a great service. And that is our motto here at Pax Villa USA Funeral Homes. But, you know, we are at the end of the day, family is family. Sometimes I want to I want to I want to just kill them and, and, and put them in the <laughs> casket. But at the end of the day, they're family. And when and when one and when one wins, we all win. Right. Sandra St. Amand, thank you so much. You're amazing. You're dynamic. I'm sure both Secretary Sal and Veronica will hear <laughs> so much about your fire, our, our, you know, quick fireside chat. Um, obviously, you know that unfortunately, all of us will experience loss in our lives. How can we get in touch with you? Oh, well. Si nous gèm moun ki mouri Miami, si nous gèm moun ki mouri Fort Lauderdale, si nous gèm moun ki mouri Palm Beach, si nous gèm moun ki mouri Orlando, si nous gèm moun ki mouri New Jersey, si nous gèm moun ki mouri Haiti. We have different offices. Um, I'm here in the Orlando, I'm here in the Orlando. So with Pax Villa Orlando at Gmail in Miami, Pax Villa Miami at Gmail and Fort Lauderdale, Pax Villa Fort Lauderdale in Gmail. If someone wants to reach me here um, personally, my office number is area code 407-246-0555, area code 407-246-0555. Merci, que bon Dieu bénin. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you so much. All right, folks, we are at our last panelist, but certainly not least. So we talked about legitimizing your business venture. We talked about raising capital. We, talk, we talked about marketing your, your venture. And then we talked about what it's like to be in a family-owned venture. And now we're going to turn to Stanley Go, who is with the Beacon Council, um, you know, incredible vice president. And he's going to tell you, or we're, we're rather going to have a conversation about relocating your business to Florida. So if you are in, whether you're in Jamaica, whether you're in Haiti, whether you're in the Bahamas, you know, Brazil, wherever you are in this world, um, if you want to relocate your business, we're going to go ahead and, and have a great conversation about that. 
Um, so Stanley, welcome. You're our last but not least speaker. How are you this evening? I'm doing good. And I got to tell you, I have to congratulate you on a fantastic performance as facilitator and moderator. So congrats. Thank to you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So for those of us who are not um, familiar with the Beacon Council, as we have, you know, I think it's 90 or so folks on the call who may or may not be from Miami. Tell us who is Stanley Ligo and, you know, what work are you doing at the Beacon Council? Sure. Well, first of all, let me also acknowledge uh, Secretary Saul for putting this program together. Uh, you and Veronica, it's really important that we put a spotlight on Haitian American, uh, uh, the Haitian American uh, community. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so for me, and, and, I, and I have to maybe follow the lead of uh, Sandra Sentaman in saying <laughs> So um, no, I I uh, I I'm also a proud Haitian, born in Haiti, moved here when I was three years old. Uh, so I, I I probably don't have too much of an accent. Um, my career started at FedEx in the private sector. I spent 25 years there uh, as a logistics provider and and a, and, and, a, and an operations manager. And then after that 25th year, I decided I want to reacquaint, reacquaint myself with the Haitian community. And I got involved with a non-for-profit organization called Wibatsi Santé Mental, which is English for uh, rebuilding mental health yeah. and specifically for the Haitian community. My father was a psychiatrist uh, and I have several people in the um, mental health uh, industry and so mental health is huge. It's people don't realize how it, it's, it, it connects to every aspect of our life. It does. So I, I did that for about three years until I realized that I needed to get back to the business community because that's really where my passion is. Mm -hmm. um, my focus has always been on global governance uh, and my experience in logistics with FedEx brought me to the Beacon Council where I lead the trade logistics uh, industry sector as one of our targeted industries in Miami. Uh, and also the Small Business Committee, uh, which is really focused on how do we help micro and small businesses. So, oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say, so the Beacon Council is the official economic development organization for Miami-Dade County, mm -hmm. uh, very similar to the work that Enterprise Florida does. Right. I always tell people, uh, if Florida were a state, keep in mind Florida is one of 50 states, uh, they would be the 18th largest economy in the world. So wow. if Miami-Dade County were a country, we would be the 39th largest economy in the world. Wow. So we're talking about billions of dollars and opportunities for, for small businesses to really tap into uh, making money and, 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 and basically doing business. And so, you know, you heard from a lot of really important community leaders here, Beatrice, uh, Newton, mm -hmm. uh, and then also from the lawyers, I mean, one of the things about the Beacon Council is that we rely on professional services to help small businesses here. So the attorneys from, you know, Greenberg Troy or, or a number of, of, of law firms that are here are critical to helping businesses succeed here. So that's, that's, that's what I do. And, uh, and the Beacon Council is an important organization in the Miami-Dade County area. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when you talk about South Florida, Miami is the brand, but when you talk about South Florida, I mean, we're what, 6.1 6 million, 6.2 million people. In some respects, we're almost a third of the state of Florida, where right. Miami uh, is really the lead when it comes to the, the uh, population and a number of other key factors. So go ahead. I'll stop. No, there. thank you. Thank you. So, you know, you that's a perfect segue, because my, my first question, or I should say second question to you is, what makes Florida such a sought after place for anyone who wants to relocate? Like between, you know, Secretary Sowell and all of his work. And for those of you who do not follow Secretary Sowell on LinkedIn, um, I think you should. Um, because I think on a daily basis, he is anywhere from Tampa to Doral to Orlando to, I mean, name your city or your county in Florida. Secretary Sowell is probably in all of those places in one day you know, really lauding, you know, new businesses, attracting new businesses to Florida, attracting not just new businesses, but also capital. 
So same thing for your work at the Beacon Council. So what makes Florida such a gem for for people to relocate their businesses here? Sure, well, I mean, Florida, uh, yeah, obviously I'm I'm a little bit biased with Miami-Dade County, but we're we're only one of 67 counties in the state of Florida. But whether it's Florida or Miami-Dade County, um, I think what Florida offers is a wealth of resources uh, for businesses um, with, and with a lot of technical um, assistance, you know, workshops right. that we have here. You, you heard a lot of talk about training sessions, uh, a lot of advice from different non-for-profit organizations, mm-hmm. um, and all forms of preparing businesses to, to, uh, to, to really be, become an entrepreneur in this vibrant market. Um, mm-hmm. The goal here is to help businesses maximize uh, businesses, business advantages that, might, that Florida has to offer. Uh, the collection of small businesses uh, that call uh, Florida their home have a big impact on, on our local economy. So their success is our success. But I would say entrepreneurship uh, is what's fueling the growth of, 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 of uh, businesses here in both in Miami-Dade, but in, more generally in the state of Florida. Mm-hmm. A combination of, of entrepreneurship and innovation is what creates, in my, in my view, an environment where small businesses can scale uh, right. and, and also accelerate. Oh, that's, that's great. So, so for organizations like Enterprise Florida and more locally, the Beacon Council, how do you help entrepreneurs thrive? Yeah. So a couple of things. Um, oh, so entrepreneurs or just small businesses in general? Small businesses in general. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, the same is true for startups, small businesses, even large businesses. Mm-hmm. First, um, we are, as a non-for-profit organization, uh, all of our work is, is free. Uh, and uh, Miami, because Miami-Dade, the Beacon Council is a, uh, a, a, a public-private partnership, mm-hmm. um, in many ways, the private side of us allows us to do things in confidentiality, mm-hmm. uh, where obviously when you're talking about local governments under the Sunshine Law, everything is public record. That's a big important piece, um, but we we focus on customizing the uh, uh, the assistance that businesses need uh, to take advantage of coming to either to Florida or to Miami Dade area. And as I said, all of our services are complementary, so that 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 includes you know market demographic information, right. uh, business cost information, site selection assistance. Yes, we help, we help with permitting. Uh, access to talent and training, um, a lot of financial referrals and assistance, and mm-hmm. of course, incentive programs uh, at the local level uh, to help offset some of that cost. Well, that's that's great. You know, I, I can't help but think about, um, and for those of you in South Florida, you've probably seen, you know, Mayor Francis Suarez um, sort of lead and usher this incredible movement called, you know, Miami Tech, right? So, as I'm as, as I'm watching him and, and you know organizations like Refresh Miami, um, you know organizations like Venture Cafe Miami, organizations like the Center for Black Innovation, um, as I think about Tech Gateway in Broward, um, and Newton mentioned you know the Fort Lauderdale Alliance earlier today, as I think about all of the work collectively that our entrepreneurial ecosystem is doing to push our state forward. Um, how important is business climate to any small business or entrepreneurial endeavor? Yeah, it is absolutely, absolutely important. And in, I think I would, I would argue it's, uh, it's the key reason why you see a lot of companies that are leaving uh, some of the northern states and even out west and looking at Miami. And coming here, that's right. Coming to Miami. I mean, when you compare our tax, uh, tax environment we have no personal, uh, state, or local taxes. Uh, it's just, and our corporate taxes are are very competitive against other metro uh, metro markets. So it just makes sense to come to Miami. But I think the growing ecosystem that you refer to is becoming, um, you know, increasingly attractive to entrepreneurs and innovators, both locally and from around the world. And much right. of it, you know, yes. Uh, Mayor Suarez is doing a, a phenomenal job in bringing some of those in, but honestly, our new mayor, uh, Levine, Mayor Daniela Daniela Levine Cava, right on top of it at all. At, I mean, 
she's just all over it. And, and much <laughs> of this rapid growth in Miami-Dade County is, is a result of the, I would say the convergence of, of Miami's tech and creative communities, yeah. um, further uh, extending it into the, you know, the life sciences and healthcare industry, the banking and finance industry, the trade and logistics right. industry. So no matter what the industry is, is you can see tech just growing. And uh, what I'm seeing in more recent years is whether it's accelerators, working spaces, all of those things have launched to offer access to these resources, to yes. mentors, to seed funding, to networking. And, and I think all of that contributes to Miami's growing tech ecosystem. No, absolutely. And I'll shamelessly plug, um, since my employer is Verizon, you know, we're right there with the, the tech ecosystem and everyone who is working to do that. You know, it's one of the, the reasons why, you know, Miami was named, even you know, last year a 5G city, right? Because we understand that technology is really going to fuel this next sort of iteration of what we what we like to refer to as the fourth industrial revolution. We know that it is going to drive it. And um, just so happy to have organizations like Enterprise Florida putting on this program. And of course, you know, your role at the Beacon Council. Um, I guess as my last question, I'll ask you, you know, for any business owners who are watch watching, who might be in the Bahamas, in Haiti, Brazil, who might be in California, who might be in Seattle, wherever they are, what resource resources should they leverage to begin that process of, you know what, Florida looks really attractive and now I think I wanna move. Yeah, I would say the key resources are you start with the state. Enterprise Florida is a very important resource. Uh, if you pull up their website, just go to enterpriseflorida.com, you will see an enormous amount of resources. From there, they have a great way of filtering it down to wherever the preference of that small business or individual is. Miami-Dade County is a, is a great recipient of some of those businesses. We do mm -hmm. very similar work. As I said, I think we're we're, we're, we're sort of sister organizations when it comes to, uh, to uh, Enterprise Florida. So definitely Enterprise Florida, if you're looking at the South Florida area, Newton mentioned the Alliance in, uh, in, in Broward, and I think uh, a BBD in- Yeah, uh, Business Development Board of Palm Beach County. Mm -hmm. That's right. And all of us do a lot of work. And I think the reason that we're successful in, in what we do is because of the partnerships that we have with you know the Florida State Minority Supplier uh, uh, Council, with Hakoff, you know uh, yes. for Jeff Lozama, who does a phenomenal, phenomenal work in bringing the community together, particularly when there's a there's a huge need out there. Yes. I, mean, I worked with uh, with Jeff a while back on the last uh, disaster that we had. Yeah, for Haiti relief. That's right. It's, it's unbelievable, and I think what he does too is he brings the community together and reminds us that we are a community. I would say, yes. you know, after the Cubans, I think Haitians are probably uh, the second largest uh, a community in this demographic. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense what, uh, you know, to, to shine a spotlight, to sp a spotlight on us. Uh, Stanley, thank you so much. Our time is up, but I really appreciate you being with us this evening, talking about the Beacon Council. So for those folks who are not from Florida, um, but wishing to relocate, how can they reach you or reach the Beacon Council? I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I, I try to be as responsive as I can on LinkedIn. We do get about a thousand calls a day and, and emails. Of course. But I always make a promise that by the by the end of the week, I, I my Sundays are uh, after church and, and spending a little time with the family. The afternoon is reserved to catching up with email. So uh, LinkedIn is probably the best. Just stand there you go, and uh, and I, I will respond. Stanley, thank you so much, and we'll talk soon. Sounds good. Thank you again. You're welcome. So for everyone um, who's still with us, thank you so much for staying on. Um, this was an incredible panel. As I stated, this is not the last. This is the first, but certainly not the last event that we're going to have. As I mentioned, EFI, Secretary Sal Veronica, want to sustain their engagement with the Haitian community. So without further ado, it was my truly my pleasure and honor to moderate this evening's discussion. And I wanna go ahead and turn it back over to Veronica Valdez. Thank you. Veronica, you're muted. Sorry about that. Murdoshi, all I can say is job well done um, to the esteemed panelists and speakers 
Wow. Wow. This is more than Secretary Sal and I could have ever dreamed of. Um, it is something that we are committed to. Um, we want to continue the engagement with small and minority businesses around the state. Um, the Haitian American business community um, is at the forefront. Um, you guys kicked it off and you did it in fine fashion. So we thank you, we thank you. It was, it was an honor and a privilege, even more so than the, the resources that were um, shared. It was an honor and a privilege to celebrate you guys. It was an honor and a privilege to celebrate you guys, to showcase you um, to the entire state of Florida so that everyone knows um, the precious gems that we have amongst us. So thank you. Um, there is so much more to come. Enterprise Florida, we will be bringing programming um, throughout the rest of the year. Um, Secretary Sal, we have a, an initiative with him that's dear to his heart, 100 Conversations. He is going around the state, um, taking the pulse of minority and small business owners. Um, he wants to hear what your concerns are what we can do at Enterprise Florida to help. Um, a very important question, recording. Um, to all our attendees, we will send out an email on Friday. Um, it will include some information regarding all of our speakers, some handouts that they want to share, but most importantly, a recording will have a link that has the actual recording. So if you wanna watch it again, most importantly, if you wanna share it with some other folks who were not able to attend, um, feel free to do so, um, so that everybody is equally excited about what we have going on. So with that, um, Secretary Sal, if we don't have any closing remarks from you, um, we can say good night. Thank you, everyone.